That would be free, yeah. So yeah, we're gonna get into like the nitty gritty of nutrition. So nutrition is like just one of the many components of planning a menu. So we'll keep that in mind, but we will kind of really get into all the different food categories and foods that you might wanna choose. And so yeah, we'll get into that. Um, we're gonna just quickly go back over menu planning, uh, some of the different components. We'll spend most of the time talking about planning healthy meals and we're gonna review this document. It's in all of your guys's do a tangs. Then we're gonna talk about portions a little bit. Um, and then our kind of hands-on thing is we'll do some label reading, which is always fun. Um, and then we're going to talk about your, your guys' menus at the end. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is just a quick review because Jordan went through all of this yesterday, but it kind of just shows you that like there's a lot of components to planning a menu. Um, budget is one of them, which we'll talk about a little bit more because that can be a really a big barrier. Um, grocery shopping, you know, if you don't have a menu planned and you like even in your personal lives, if you don't have like a rough idea of what you're going to cook over the week, you can go grocery shopping and just go a little bit crazy and then find that you actually are missing some ingredients for meals. And so it can really help with the grocery shopping component and like having lists. Uh, it helps to plan like healthy, well-balanced meals. So like what Jordan was talking about, all the different types of foods, but also like different textures, different colors, things like that. Um, it can be nice to have a menu um, like Marie was talking about, so you can post it, which is really great if you have kids in your school that have allergies. Um, so you can post the menu and then they can like let their parents know. Um, time, we talked about time a lot yesterday. So having a menu, you can figure out like, okay, I'll need to take this out three days in advance. Um, it helps you plan for staff. Like if you've got a few meals that are really labor intensive, like lasagna, you can bring on people. And like Hillary kind of talked about, it can help with food waste. So there's a ton of things that go into planning a menu. So we're just gonna focus in on um, nutrition today. So basically, this, have any of you guys seen this document before? It's basically like the document in this province right now for schools to use when picking foods. So it's called Nutrition Standard for Saskatchewan Schools. It goes through all the different food categories and basically divides foods into three groups. So foods that you can choose often, like every day, foods that you could choose sometimes, which can be a little vague, but like two to three times a week, and then foods that you wanna serve rarely. So like maybe special circumstances or whatever your brain defines as rarely. What is a little bit unfortunate is that this document is in the process of being updated. I'm on like the group doing it and it's just not released yet and there's a lot of changes. So we're gonna spend today going through this and then there's gonna be a new one coming out probably in the fall, even though it's ready now. The, the government, it'll probably be the fall. <laughs> and one of the biggest changes is that there's gonna be only two categories in the new one. It's gonna be serve, like recommended to offer and recommended to not offer. Um, so when that happens, like Tammy and I will come out to the schools and we'll review it with all the cooks again. Um, and I think the main reason for that switch was that the sometimes category can people may decipher that differently like maybe sometimes to me is twice a week maybe sometimes to you could be once a day so i think with the new guidelines it's just meant to be easier for people um, but for today we'll go through the each categories basically the serve most often category like i won't list every single food and every item but serve most often can you guys guess which type of foods these are going to be in each category like what types of foods do you think are going to be like every day? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what you guys are saying is like just whole foods, not processed foods. So that's what you're going to see in the serve most often category. So for vegetables and fruits, Serve most often brew will be like your actual just fruits and vegetables that are minimally processed or not processed at all. So like your raw veggies, 
your fruits um, or maybe cooked veggies, but there's not like a ton added to them. Um, this can also be your frozen veggies. Frozen veggies are an excellent option. Like especially in the north, sometimes the fresh vegetables that we're buying are they're pretty much at the end of their life and they've actually even sometimes lost a little bit of nutrients. So when fr vegetables are frozen, they're frozen when they're at their like ripe nutrition. So frozen veggies are an excellent option. They can be really like a good uh, price too. Um, frozen fruit is a great option, especially for like smoothies and stuff. So that would be in this column. Um, fruit or veggies that are canned in water would be in this column. Um, Cause they're, I mean, they're processed technically, but very minimally, there hasn't been a ton added to it. And you can always rinse them too. Um, so homemade veggie soups. So very minimally processed. And then the middle category, the serve sometimes, they've had a little bit of processing. When I say processing, do you guys know kind of what I mean by that? It can mean a million different things, but it basically just means you've taken something from its whole form and you've done something to it. So you've maybe added salt or fat to it. You've, you've processed it. And when we do add salt, fat, um, things like that, that's kind of what moves it into the surf sometimes category. So canned frozen vegetables and fruit that have salt or fat added to them. Um, those are now in the surf sometimes. Canned veggie soups because they, they add quite a bit of salt as part of the processing. Um, fruit that's canned in syrup. So instead of being canned in water, it's canned in syrup. And I find in the north, it can be tricky to find fruit packed in water. That's okay, you can rinse it. That's like an easy way kind of around it. Um, dried fruit is in the serve sometimes group. Can any of you guess why it is in the sometimes group and not the serve often? Yeah, exactly. And it really sticks to teeth. So it's got more risks for children getting cavities in their mouth. Um, so it is fruit, it's great. It's in the serve sometimes, but it is good to remember that when kids are eating like sticky, fruit products, it, it sticks to their teeth and it stays on there for a while. And so then it kind of can increase their risk for, for cavities. And that is also like your fruit leathers and your fruit bars, anything that's sticky, like if you eat it yourself and you, you're like, it's like in your teeth a while later, it, it, that's happening with the kids too. Salsa, um, yeah. And then serve rarely. What does serve rarely mean to you guys? <laughs> like for frequency, what would that mean for you? Once a month, okay. That feels right to me. <laughs> but yeah, it might be different for everybody, but serve rarely just means it's not every day, it's maybe not every week, but every school can kind of decide that on their own. Oh, and then something I wanted to mention at the beginning, in Saskatchewan, like this, this document is their guidelines. They're not enforced. So nobody's gonna show up to your school and be like, oh, there's a serve often food or a serve rarely food several times a month on here. You have to change your menu. These are not enforced. These are just guidelines that are there to support schools when they're planning their menu. There are other countries where this type of thing is enforced, but guess what the difference is for those countries compared to Saskatchewan? Can anyone guess? Government funding. So in Saskatchewan, obviously we talked about this, there's no funding for the school meal programs. So how could the government say, these are, these are mandatory standards that you have to enforce, but we're not gonna provide you with any money to do it. So that's why here are their guidelines. So nobody's gonna come around and enforce these. They're, they're just meant to be like as a support to you. So serve rarely is your deep fried things. So when things are deep fried, even when it's in like a, like a unsaturated oil, like canola oil, it's still adding a lot of fat to the product. So that's what shifts it into serve rarely. Um, fruit flavored drinks that have lots of sugar in them. These categories are all based on nutrition criteria, which we're gonna talk about a lot more when we get to the label section. But they're not kind of just thrown in these categories, they're based on nutrition amounts in the foods. So we don't need to get into those specific numbers, but like, for example, if something has 5% or less of fat, you may see it in the serve most often. So it's the nutrition composition of foods 
that puts them into these categories. Um, fruit pies, pastries, candies, um, potato chips, kind of, oh yeah, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if the catalogs are where it's like the corn fried Yeah, like the pre-made. Definitely. So like if you're buying the pre-made package and then there's a whole section in here for pre-bought things because for those circumstances you would look at the nutrition label and have a peek at what's in there because some of them may be a lot less processed than others. Um, but yeah, if you were just actually shredding your own potatoes to make hash browns, that would definitely be different than like the pre-bought ones. But that sounds labor intensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. right yeah that's such a good point but yeah there is a lot of different things that you can consider and again remember like nutrition is just one component obviously it's a really important component because some kids are getting most of their nutrition at school so we always want to keep that in mind you know this can be a place where kids get those nutrition blocks that they need for growing but kids eating what you're making and enjoying it and you making foods that you like um, those are all really important factors too so like tater tot casserole awesome not dissing that at all but it's probably um, not something that you would make every single day yeah any questions on like the veggies and fruit category pickles are only on there because they're super salty <laughs> yes Yeah, for sure. So any like fresh or frozen fruits or veggies like berries, all that is going to be in the every single day, um, frozen, fresh. You know, if you've got people donating berries, incorporate those into your meal plan, however you see fit. Um, beans, legumes, like all of those traditional veggies, squash, those are perfect. Those are all going to be in the serve most often category. So you can definitely incorporate those as much as you have access to them. Yeah, and then offer rarely, these are some of the things that we just wanted to go over again. So the fruit snacks, the like they probably have more sugar that would put them in the serve rarely option, but the really important thing is that effect they have on the kids' teeth. Um, and then like juices, like I don't know if you guys see kids at your schools drinking a lot of juices and pops and stuff. Um, you know, water is the best choice, so what we have available at our schools is basically what kids are going to be able to access so those are always just good things to keep in mind and then the canned fruit that's packed in heavy syrup um, it's just always better to look and see if you can get the packed in water or even in its own juices before the heavy syrup option so then we'll go into the kind of next food category so whole grains this just seems like it's always kind of the most complicated food category because there's so many foods that fall into this. So this is going to be anything made from grains like um, rice, pasta, anything made with flour because flour is a grain, like it's a pulverized grain. So this is a big food group and you can get a lot of pre-made foods like granola bars and stuff that are primarily made from grains. So I do think nutrition label reading is really important with this category. So serve most often are going to be your whole grain choices. So I think that one of my slides talks, it actually shows a grain and I'll go back over it then. But when you actually like harvest a grain from the field, the outer husk is where all the fiber is. And then there's the germ. Is it the germ and then in the middle is the endosperm so the endosperm and the germ is where the that like white flour comes from so when you buy like white bread they've taken the outer husk off and then they've just mashed up everything else but when you buy whole grain they leave that outer husk on and that's where all the fiber is so when you see like the little bits of brown in the flour that's like the good stuff that's where a lot of those b vitamins which give kids energy so when we can choose whole grain there's just going to be more nutrition in it. So those are in the most often. So whole grain, anything like you can get whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, wild rice. If you have access to that in your schools, it's extremely nutritious and high in fiber. Um, 
bagels, anything made with flour, if you can get it in the whole grain, that'll definitely be your most often. How does whole grain things go over in your schools? Like whole wheat bread, whole grain bread. Do the kids like it? Yeah. Yeah, kids can be fussy, especially if they've not been eating like whole wheat breads at home. It can seem really different to them. So you can even try offering both because there might be a few kids that might like it. Um, the white grains are the sometimes category anyway. They just have a little bit less fiber in them. Uh, barley is in the most often. Do any of you guys use like barley in your soups? Yeah. Yeah. So barley is really nutritious, super high in fiber. Do you guys know like why fiber is so good for us? Do you know what it does like for our bodies? Yeah, it's super good for your heart. Uh, it helps like, it's really good for our guts. Um, it helps us like go to the bathroom regularly, which people laugh at, but if you've ever been constipated, it's like not fun. So it's really got lots of fiber in it. But I think most importantly for kids, is it it keeps you feeling full for longer which is great because if you're not going to have a snack again for a couple of hours you know we don't want kids feeling hungry at school so if they have two pieces of whole grain bread you know it might be enough fiber in there to hold them over until their next snack or lunch if you don't have a morning snack whereas if it's two pieces of white bread it just gets digested a lot quicker in the body and then you can feel hungry a lot quicker so the surf sometimes is, is all those same things. They're just the white versions. So they're not the whole grain version. That outer husk has been taken off. This is where most cereals get found just because cereals are like a boxed food, like they've been processed. There are really great options for cereals. And then there are options where it's like basically like mostly sugar. So cereals are definitely one of those products where if you're ordering it bulk and you're serving it like every month, it's worth looking at the nutrition label and seeing what's in it and then and then going forward with buying it. So white rice, um, white crackers, most granola bars fall into this category. Some of them would probably go into the serve rarely category because some granola bars are actually more like chocolate bars. Like if it's like got a bunch of caramel in it and chocolate, around it it's it's closer to a chocolate bar at that point than like a granola bar if it's got like lots of nuts it might be more in the serve sometimes category but the only way to know there's like a thousand granola bars there's almost like a whole grocery shelf at this point for them you just need to look at the nutrition label so when we'll go through that but for a granola bar you'd be kind of wanting to see some fiber in there and you'd be wanting to not see like a ton of sugar in there but yeah granola bars can be tricky and then serve rarely are kind of like your sweets that fall into this category. So pastries, donuts, cakes, cupcakes, um, th those things that are kind of more of like uh, celebration type things or every once in a while type foods. Instant noodles fall into this category just because the powder that comes with them is really high in salt. It's why they're so delicious, <laughs> um, but they're really salty. So that's, that's kind of why they fall into there. It's like a pasta, but the, the sauce that comes with them is really salty. Yeah. So yeah, we, we talked about this. So tips for choosing your whole grains. Choose whole grains when you can. Like maybe your kids would be more susceptible to a whole grain pasta than a whole grain bread. You can always try it out. And then if it goes really poorly, you know, you can switch back to the product that you know they like. Um, and then when we're looking at the nutrition label, you want to try to see like at least two grams of fiber. Four would be even better. It kind of depends on the, the food though. And we'll, we will practice that. Like we're going to look at some labels at the end here. And this is that picture I was talking about. So this is like literally a piece of grain, like the farmers all over Saskatchewan are growing grain. If you went and grabbed one out of the stalk, that outer part is where the fiber is. And then it's the endosperm. That's kind of like what you're seeing when you look at flower. And then the germ is in there too. And there's like some really good stuff in there. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's a really good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mixing 50-50, especially if you're like making bannock and you want to try to get some fiber in there, you can try mixing like 50% white flour, 50% whole wheat flour. Or if you're like making your own waffles or pancakes, you can even just do like one quarter whole wheat flour. You're still going to get lots of benefits from that fiber. Um, if you're doing your own baking, like muffins and stuff, obviously we want the product to be like tasty at the end. Like whole wheat bannock is just not that tasty <laughs> it just doesn't really turn out all that well so 50 50 is probably better or you guys would know i'm i suck at making bannock i've tried it's not usually very good at the end because i do yeah. yes and actually that goes over better yes i've had bannock with oats and that is really good Oats are another good, actually they weren't in the, they weren't listed at all, so I'm glad you brought that up, but like rolled oats, like those bags of oats and oatmeal and stuff, oats are like a really high in fiber, so oats are a great option, and they do make a nicer bannock than like whole wheat flour, and you can throw oats into like um, muffins and all kinds of things, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to note, if you are substituting whole wheat flour, it does need a little bit more moisture um, to get hydrated. So it can be a little bit drier. Um, so you might have to play around with the, the liquid content in your recipe. You might not, like don't plan for it to turn out right the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you might need to test it a little bit, um, but add more liquid, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's moisture, like what you're just saying, right? So with, with whole wheat, it doesn't have the same gluten development as a white grain. And so the egg probably provides more structure to the bread, I would think, and more leavening. Yeah, so if you do go from whole wheat, from white to whole wheat, you'll notice it's more dense, it's heavier, it's maybe not as fluffy. Um, so again, it's kind of an experiment. You have to definitely you have to play around with it a little bit and it will be a little bit different you just have to find what's tolerable Makes sense. yeah it's definitely something you can play around with if like adding fiber is a goal for your menu yeah so we talked about this these are kind of your what's that Yeah, it sounds like that's what these people are having some luck with. Makes sense. Like, it could be a good place to start for sure. <laughs> okay, so the next category is like your protein foods. So when I say protein foods, which foods come to your guys' mind for protein foods? Like when you hear protein, what foods do you think of? That's good. Yeah. Meats, yeah, meats, eggs, um, beans, things like that that are going to give you lots of protein. So the serve most often category for your protein foods, you know, first one on the list would be your wild meats. Those are just so high in iron and protein and other nutrients and very low in like saturated fats. So, you know, if you've got people donating wild meat to your school program, it's absolutely would be the number one under your serve most often category. Um, and then it would be your kind of like farmed meats, so like beef, um, pork, any of those meats that are just actually like not processed meats, so like fresh cuts of meat, so like a roasted chicken, a pork shoulder, like um, not fried or processed things like that. So roasted, baked, grilled, um, that's your, and then fish would be enough. Do you guys, how does fish go over in your programs? Oh, okay, yeah. You can't do fish? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, I kind of figured. Which is, is a too bad because fish are like super food. Like they're very nutritious. They have really healthy fats, a ton of iron. They're really good for kids' brain development. But obviously if there's allergies and most of your kids hate fish, then you won't put it on there. <laughs> but it would be in the surf most often category. Um, what about, yeah, like probably canned fish would be the same. Obviously not for the allergies, but yeah. Um, and then like your protein foods that come from not animals are also in this category like nuts which if you've got allergies do all of you pretty much have nut allergies in your schools okay so yeah your main protein foods are probably going to be eggs and meat um how do eggs go beans absolutely yep cheese how do eggs go over in your schools you serve eggs you serve eggs, yeah. Right, there's something else for them. Yeah. Nice, yeah. And then the last thing in that list is your beans. So um, if you guys do like chilies or soups or casseroles, you can try throwing beans. Do any of you guys ever play around with like chickpeas or lentils or anything like that? No. You do? Okay, yeah. Saskatchewan's like one of the biggest producers of chickpeas and, and then we eat very little of them in this province, but they're also really nutritious, but beans go a long way with kids too. I have a trick. Mm. So uh, a lot of you use beef in your recipes and that was very popular in, in my school as well. Um, but what I would do is I'd pulse, I'd take black beans, white onion, and you could do throw some mushrooms in there if you're feeling crazy. And I'll, in the Roboku, which I'll show you, you pulse it so that it almost looks like ground beef, like it has the same texture. And when you cook it up and you mix it with ground beef, they will not know that it's even in there. So you could swap black hmm? beans. Black beans. So you can swap that out. You're saving a ton of money. Mm -hmm. It's more nutritious. And also it cleans nicer out of like the, I don't know if it's the carbohydrate or the starch in the bean, but your dishes don't stick. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you have your chili that sticks to the pot or whatever. It really comes clean a lot nicer. So it's a good, it's a really good way to sneak it in there. I have not. cheap and easy because like the black beans I would have bought canned but lentils you don't need to soak they're just ready to go so yeah you can swap those too it, it's saucy anyway yeah I think if there's a sauce lentils are good for that if you're looking like if you're doing we used to do like taco salad mm -hmm. um that's where it's a little bit more obvious if you don't have a really saucy meat that's when i would do the black bean because it resembles the beef um so it really just depends what it is that you're making did you have a question I just have yeah yeah Like kidney beans would be good there. You can do it with a lot of different beans, yeah. 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 
Yeah, whereas a lentil just explodes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we do always throw beans in when we do tacos at home. So serve sometimes in this category is basically everything in the serve most often with more processing done to it. So deli meats, and absolutely, and your schools will probably do deli meats because sandwiches are, are a staple with kids. So they're for sure on there, um, but they're just in the serve sometimes because deli meats have had some salt added to them as part of becoming a deli meat. And usually a little bit more fat has been added. Um, packaged meats, like packaged meatballs, and it depends on the product. So any packaged food, it's worth looking at the nutrition label especially if you have like a four week cycle menu and meatballs are on it and you're going to be buying meatballs like all year. Um, you know, you could, which if you're using like a supplier company, you can work with them to pick their most nutritious often. Or if you're buying at the grocery store, just take a peek at the nutrition labels because some might be a lot less processed than others. Um, hamburger patties, breaded fishes or meats. So when you're getting into breaded, like pre-packaged breaded products, like, pre-packaged cutlets. They, they're they usually a little bit higher in fat, a little bit higher in salt um, than just regular chicken would be. Um, or, you know, you can try to do those things homemade, but I know that's really labor intensive too. So that's why there is a serve sometimes category. You know, it might not be on your menu every single week, but if your kids love it, maybe it's something you'd do once in your four week cycle menu or something like that. And then nuts that have been like salted or sweetened. Um, but I don't think a lot of schools are doing nuts anyway. And then the serve rarely category in this one is your very processed meats. So sausages, smokies, hot dogs, bacon, pepperoni. They're just a little bit even more processed than deli meats. So the nutrition criteria of them bumps them over one more time. So typically a little bit higher in saturated and trans fats and salt. Um, and sometimes sugar, depending on the, the meat. So they're served rarely, like schools are gonna definitely offer these foods. It's kind of just about trying to find that balance with what your kids like and how often you're offering it. Um, pizza pops, pogo sticks, kind of the obvious, like super tasty, but fairly processed. Like would your great grandmother recognize a pogo stick? Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, these are just pictures of what we already talked about, so, yeah. Boots to limit, we don't really need to go into this again. It's just all the different categories we've already talked about. These are just some pictures of them. French fries are one of those ones where they can be a food to limit, but like if you've got a fancy machine that can cut actual potatoes into fries and you're baking them, that's a whole different story than like deep frying store-bought French fries. So there's kind of a spectrum for some of these foods for sure. Do any of you make homemade fries? I know it's labor intensive. Yeah, you do? At home. Oh, yeah. at home, yeah, yeah. For four people. Do you do it in your school? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, that would be not. You get one fry. And you yeah. get one fry. <laughs> yeah. And then this is our protein foods with calcium. Like when the new Canada's Food Guide came out in 2019, they kind of got rid of like dairy as a food group. They got rid of food groups basically all together, but this is the dairy food group that we're talking about. So in the choose most often foods, like when we are choosing dairy products to offer in our school, we want to try to choose ones that do have protein in them. Um, and then also calcium and vitamin D. So in the serve most often, you'll see like milk, like just 1%, 2% milk. What type of milk do you guys offer in your schools? 2%, is that the most common? Yeah, that's a, that's a nice choice. We definitely don't need to be like limiting fat and milk and children in schools. Um, yeah. Homemade milk-based soups. Do any of you guys make like creamy soups or are you making yeah. more? You do. Like what kind? Mushroom. Oh, nice. Yeah. And you make it homemade? Homemade. 
Oh wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and they and they eat it. Great, nice. Skim milk powder seems like a weird thing to to list on here, um, but I've actually met a few people that add it to their bannock, and then their bannock all of a sudden is really high in calcium, which is kind of cool, especially if you have a lot of kids that don't love milk in your program. So you can add skim milk powder to different things, like you could probably even throw it in your mushroom soup. Fortified soy beverages. Um, are any of you guys offering plant-based milks or beverages in your school? Yeah. And is it because of preferences or allergies or? Okay, that's usually, okay. They maybe have a cow's milk allergy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in those situations, it does make sense. It's usually a bit more expensive than white milk. So, you know, if, if you have kids that enjoy milk, you probably don't need to get the plant-based alternatives, but if you've got allergies and preferences and stuff, then it makes sense. And then yogurt is another one of these products where there's like a bajillion different options. Some of them are very, very high in sugar. And then some of them are like really high in protein and calcium and vitamin D. So it's another one where you might want to take the time to look at the label um, to pick one that's got some protein in there. Like, do any of you guys try like Greek yogurts or do you do yogurts in your school? Yeah? Fruit cups and stuff? Yeah. Do you ever get the Greek kind of yogurts? No, I've never tried it. Yeah. You know, it, they are slightly more expensive, so it may not work, but if you want to try it, they're just a bit higher in protein. So that's always nice, especially if, if you've got kids that are like picky with meat and other the protein things. So then if we're speaking eggs, we probably get that I don't know that's that big bag, that's a lot. Yeah. Or fruit yeah. or berries. Frozen yeah. berries, they're liquidy and so it mixes really nice with, with yogurt. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, or look at the nutrition label, like they may not be uh... Oh, there's one right in front of me. That one's lower, that one's 25% less. So that's a low sugar option. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. For sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. one there. Yeah. Um, so and that's a really good point. This, but way better. <laughs> I was I just looked at the nutrition label on this one and I was surprised to see the sugar level because it, it's vanilla Greek yogurt. And I was like, oh that's actually pretty good. But it's a it's twenty five percent less sugar. So if you can find this one in bulk, then that would be a really great option. Um, yeah. And like these are just the things where we need to try to find balance, like even the big Iogo bags of vanilla yogurt, like that's still way better than like other things our kids could be eating. So it's all about trying, if you can't get the other kind or they won't eat the other kind, it's still gonna be better to like get this kind, you know. One thing you could also do is have a bag of that Iogo and then regular and you just mix it, like dilute yeah. it a little bit, yeah. sneak it in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wean them off of the sweet yogurt. Yeah. 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 Stop yeah. giving away my next slides. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Sneaky. Sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing on the serve often is like the hard cheeses, like blocks of cheddar and stuff. And I think you guys talk about this, but it is cheaper to buy like big blocks and shred it yourself than to buy the shredded because you're kind of paying somebody else to do the 
shredding for you. Yeah. Yeah, shit. I did not know that. If you ever compare the two, it's a completely different product. Yeah, I never yeah. buy shredded cheese, so that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, and isn't it like on the bag, it's like milk product? It's not even, it's got lots of preservative and stuff in it too. Shreds cheese. I haven't used a Roboku I'm in a so while, excited. so you're setting the bar really high I've for my demo today. I've never even seen a Roboku. <laughs> yeah. So the serve sometimes, and I, I don't have tons after this, sorry if people are getting bored with like nutrition, I know it can be. Um, so serve tums sometimes is whole milk, so the only reason why it's moved into serve sometimes is because the fat percentage, has, it, the nutrition criteria moves it into serve sometimes. Whole milk is like appropriate more so for like a one to two year old, and then kids don't need that amount of fat necessarily for the growth or development, but you know, what you do at home or what you choose to do in your schools based on your individual situations. Maybe you would have it in your program. Chocolate or flavored milk is in the serve sometimes category because it has a lot of sugar in it. It's kind of like a controversial product to talk about because kids drinking chocolate milk, at least in my like laid back dietitian opinion, is still better than kids not drinking milk at all because there's lots of calcium and vitamin D in it. So, I, you know, white milk is definitely got a lot less sugar than chocolate milk. But if your kids are outright refusing it, you know, you can offer both or you can mix them together. Or depending on where you buy your groceries from, you can get chocolate milk that's reduced in sugar. Is the Dairyland or do you know which, which brand is it? I don't, I think it's Dairyland. It isn't as readily available as like just regular chocolate milk, but you know, just remember that these are just guidelines. You can apply them to your schools however you see fit, but there is a place sometimes for chocolate milk, I think, if especially if your kids are not getting a lot of like calcium and vitamin D from other foods. So I'm not like recommending everybody go out and buy chocolate milk, but I don't want to diss it entirely either. Uh, flavored yogurt, so we, we talked about yogurt already, milkshakes, um, yeah, and then in the serve rarely are kind of more of like your dairy based treats, like ice cream, full fat cream, which kids don't really drink like coffee, I mean you might put it in when you're making like, like would you put that in your mushroom soup, but it's like a small amount being spread over a really large thing, yeah, whipped cream, um, cream cheese, Cream cheese, it just has more fat than the hard blocks of cheese. But if you're using it again in like a big casserole that's being divided up into many servings, then yeah, these are just pictures of the same things that we already talked about. Um, and then this is just a quick section on beverages. I do think that kids, and there's research that shows that like kids are definitely drinking a lot of sugar sweetened beverages in the schools and like I know I'm when I am seeing lots of kids there's like a lot of black mouths in the schools like a lot of a lot of cavities happening in really young kids and the sugar sweetened beverages are definitely one of the reasons behind that and I think kids have access to them a lot in their lives in general especially like older kids that can go and buy them themselves so School is kind of a nice place to try to just have the more healthy drinks available, like the white milk and the water. Um, so yeah, this, the serve most often is basically water and milk. Like kids only need water and milk. They don't need other drinks to like grow and develop or anything like that. Serve sometimes, the only thing is basically 100% fruit juice. So that literally means like if you look at the ingredients, it's just the juice of the fruit it's still really high in sugar like even 100 percent fruit juice is still really high in sugar like almost comparable to pop still just because fruits have so much natural sugar in them and then when you make juice it gets like more concentrated so the serve sometimes juice a couple times a week maybe in small amounts and you can also do things like water juice down or put a bunch of ice in there if you are offering it 
And then the serve rarely is basically everything else. So like iced teas, any type of juice that has like the word cocktail or punch, those have almost like left the realm of fruit entirely. And it's just a uh, processed sugary kind of fake drink at that point with like artificial juice flavorings in it. And there, there is a lot of sugar in it. And I do think it's really hard on kids' teeth. So something to keep in mind. And then energy drinks, I feel really passionately about not having them available at all. There's very few things that I think that you should be like, no, never. But I do think energy drinks can be harmful and that we probably shouldn't be offering them at our schools. They just have ridiculous amounts of caffeine in them. It's like drinking like four strong coffees really quickly. They have like weirdly high levels of B vitamins in them, like more than you would ever need to consume. And I don't know that there's like research on what that could do. So, and then if we're talking about older kids, if they were like also drinking alcohol, then that's just a bad scenario altogether. So no, no, it has like electrolytes in it, um, which, you know, like gives kids energy. Um, but an energy drink is like Red Bull or what are the Monsters, other monsters? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Energy drinks scare me. They, they actually scare me. They're, they're just not what we want the children we love to be putting into their bodies. Um, and even Gatorade though, like Gatorade is I think more so meant for like when you're doing sports and you're sweating profusely and you need to quickly replenish your electrolytes. So if your kid's just sitting in the class, like not doing anything, they don't really need like a Gatorade. The Gatorades do have quite a bit of sugar in them. Is there Gatorades that have? They have, they have there's zero, zero sugar. sugar. Yeah. That's like a whole other thing that we don't really need to get into, but like there's a lot of drinks that are also just sweetened with artificial sugars, um, which I still think there's a good goal to reduce those as well, because like artificial sugars are probably a little bit better than copious amounts of regular sugar, but I don't think they give kids any benefits either. As long as you're not sharing with the kids, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> and don't mix it with alcohol. <laughs> Bars are actually not even allowed to sell energy drinks mixed. Yeah. So like when you order a uh, vodka Red Bull, yeah, they have to serve them separately because there's such high risks. Um, so this is the last thing before we get into the label reading. It's kind of about like portions and sizes. So I think we've moved away from being like measure out a quarter cup of this and, you know, six servings of this. We're not really recommending like such specific amounts anymore. We're more so looking at the plate and the balance of the plate, which you talked about yesterday. So roughly, if you look at these pictures, like half the plate, fruits or vegetables or fruits and vegetables, you know, fruits and veggies are the things that give kids a lot of the, they're called micronutrients. So that's like a lot of the vitamins and minerals. So roughly half the plate or like two hands worth is a good amount. Um, and then the, like the grains section. So whether that's like wild rice or potatoes or pasta, it's about a quarter of the plate or maybe like the size of your fist, but the quarter of the plate is kind of the balance you're looking for. And then your protein foods. So whether that's like plant proteins like beans or if it's your eggs or your meat, that's roughly a quarter of the rest of the plate. And then maybe you would have some dairy with it, like a glass of milk or something like that. But so that's kind of the balance you're looking for. Like when you're serving up your takeout containers or whatever, halves maybe veggies and then the other quarter is your meat or your protein and the other quarter is your um, grain and then when it comes to like how much kids are actually eating i put some posters in your bags that are about mealtime rules because um, i think a lot of like parents and caregivers we put a lot of pressure on ourselves 
to want kids to eat the amount of food we're serving because we have in our mind like this is a good amount for them to eat for being healthy but ultimately like our responsibility as caregivers parents cooks people serving is to offer the food to their kid give them an opportunity to eat the food with others at a table ideally because i know some schools serve in the class or do does everyone serve meals in the classrooms yeah so the kids are sitting at their tables but they're all together so that's great and then you have regular meal times at your schools so you guys are doing all your responsibilities by having regular meal times regular snack times so the kids always know there's this is an opportunity where i'm going to be able to eat and i'm sure they know they can tell you if they're hungry and you'll give them something um and then you give them a place to eat and then you give them the foods you choose as the caregivers which foods you're offering you make your menus and then it's up to us to just let the kids decide how much they're going to eat and if they're going to eat at all and it can be really tough especially if kids aren't eating a lot but it isn't really our responsibility to try to get them to eat more and usually when we like try to get kids to eat more it just ends up feeling like pressure to kids and then they want to eat even less so you can take that burden of responsibility off of yourself. You know, your guys' roles are to do all the things you're already doing, and then they can decide basically how much they're gonna eat. And it can suck if you're seeing a lot of food being thrown out. And if you are seeing a lot of food being thrown out, you can offer smaller amounts. If it seems like, like maybe in your mind, you're picturing more of like an adult size. And then if you're seeing a lot of food being thrown out, you can start offering less and let them know like if you want more just let me know like you can have more so does that make people feel better or worse or how do you feel about those kind of mealtime rules were you ever were you told you need you will not leave this table until you finish what's the clean on your plate, plate club <laughs> no no yeah, a lot just of us. Just me? <laughs> yeah, no. Just me? <laughs> yeah, a lot of us were. It was just, I think, what the, that generation was taught is, you know, you're not allowed to get up from this table till you finish your plate. It was done out of a place of love, absolutely. But what it taught us was that our parents or our caregivers know what amount is best for us and that we should ignore what our own body is telling us. And so now when we go to restaurants and we order, like, fettuccine alfredo when we get this ginormous plate we like compulsively eat it and even when we're starting to feel unwell because it's so much food because um, we've been taught to to clean our plate off so it, it kind of takes the because children are born with like a natural ability to eat until they're full and to stop eating when they're full and to eat when they're hungry like this is just like an innate ability that people are born with but then when you're kind of told all the time, like eat more, you have to eat that, you have to eat everything on your plate. You're not allowed to have dessert unless you have your vegetables. That can kind of mess with our brains and then we lose the ability to listen to our own internal signals of hunger and fullness. Um, that's kind of like what mindful eating is all about. Eating slow enough that you can feel your body getting full and then like stopping when you feel satisfied and knowing it's okay to like leave some food on your plate. It is really hard when you grew up one way and then, yeah. So. And be sick. <laughs>
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like if children ever want more and you have it, you can absolutely give it to them. And if you genuinely don't have it, then tell them like, I, we've run out, but is there something else I can get you? Like, we want to honor children's levels of like hunger and fullness as much as we can. I have taken way too much time. I did not realize the time. Damn it, you should have told me. I've doubled my time. <laughs> We're going to just cruise through label reading really fast. Well, I won't. Well, should, okay. we, should we take a quick stretch maybe? Do and you then... guys want to? The actual break is in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Do you guys want to stand up for five or? Good. Okay. Okay. So... La food labels can be overwhelming, but they can also be an incredibly useful tool, especially if you're going to pick a product and then order it ongoing. It's worth the time to look at it. So nutrition labels have nutrition facts on them, ingredient lists, nutrition claims, and health claims. So I'm going to go through all those things, um, and we're going to use this package of spaghetti as our example. And then I can pass around labels if you guys want to I'm just gonna put some look at them. Yeah, now, great. So nutrition facts is the actual box called nutrition facts. You won't find it on like a fresh fruit or vegetable, but anything that comes in a package will have a nutrition facts table. The first really good thing to look at on a nutrition facts table is the amount of food that that information is about. And then you kind of need to think like, is that the amount I'll be eating or serving? And then maybe make some math. So like a box of spaghetti, the amount that they're telling us about is a quarter of the box. Um, and then this is where we get all of our information on the nutrition content of that food. So calories, which everybody focuses on calories, but I don't know that it's actually a helpful number really at all. Um, like a banana has 100 calories in it, but um, Timbit also has 100 calories in it, but the, what's in it is very different. Um, your fats, I think I, yeah. The percent daily value is what I think is the most helpful part of a nutrition label. It's a number you can look at and make a very quick decision. So it's based on kind of the average amount of calories a person would eat in the day. 5% um, or little means there's not very much, very little in that food. Between five, so 5% or little is usually if we're talking about like salt, fat, and sugar or nutrients that we want less of, that's what's gonna put foods in that serve most often category. So 5% or less means a little. Between five and 15 is kind of just like a moderate amount. More than 15% means a lot. So if we're looking at nutrients that we want lots of, like fiber, vitamins, calcium, iron, you want to see big percent daily values. So like if you're looking at iron and you see like 15%, that's great. That means there's a lot of iron in that product. If you're looking at nutrients that in general we want to watch and have less of in our diet, then that's when you're hoping to see like 5% or less. So saturated fat, sodium, sugar, when you're looking at the percent daily value for those nutrients, 5% or little is, is great. Those are gonna be like the serve most often probably. More than 15%, there's probably a different product you can find that might be a little bit better in most circumstances. Um, and then, okay. So something positive, like in my opinion, that's positive that changed recently. There never used to be a percent daily value for sugar. It was just grams. So if I say to you there's, um, 30 grams of sugar in this granola bar. What does that mean to you? Okay. It, yeah. Okay. That was a bad example. <laughs> can you, can you, you can't know picture what grams of sugar. Yeah. Looks like? Does that make any sense to you? It's yeah. just not super. Four grams is one teaspoon. Yeah. So 30 grams is two yeah. tablespoons. So it would be yeah. a lot, but in general, grams doesn't translate in our brain to like, oh, I can look at that and I know there's a lot. So now there's a percent daily value for sugar, which I think is great. You know, you can look at a granola bar. If there's like 20% sugar, find, find a better one. There's like, there's better ones. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, ounces mean nothing yeah, in my mind. Like 
I hate ounces. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So remember yesterday, we, you know, we looked at a menu and and we talked about having balance. So if you have something on your menu that maybe is higher in salt or higher in sugar, can you find something that's a little bit lower in that daily percentage? Or if you still wanna offer that item, can we look at the other items that are offered that day or that week and try to balance it with something that fits more into this category? That's yeah. basically what we're trying to do here is just look at what we're offering and can we get it into that under that 15 or over that five for the good stuff yeah yeah that's a really good point and then the ingredient list is just literally where everything that is in that food is listed it's listed by weight so if you look at something and like sugar is the first ingredient again you can probably find a different product this is also where they're just going to be listed um, if there's allergies in it some things just a lot of companies i find just put a blanket statement out there may contain soy and nuts and they're just protecting themselves in case there's cross contamination like in their factories so that can be a little bit frustrating so what is better than like when you're using oils like oil is and i think they all kind of have their own place so Canola oil, vegetable oil, olive oil, those are unsaturated oils, so those are good choices. We still want to be kind of aware of how much we're using. There's a big difference between like sauteing and a small amount of olive or canola oil and deep frying in canola oil. Um, but then the lards and butter are saturated fats. So I hate the word unhealthy, but those fats are kind of the ones that over time can increase the risk for like heart disease. So when possible, oh, when possible, we wanna choose unsaturated fats like the olive oil, and then even unsaturated fats and things like fish and nuts, those are really good for your heart. So it's kind of about finding a balance, but like if you're baking something and it only tastes good when you make it with butter, then, then do that, you know, like try to find that balance. But if you're using butter in your muffins that day, use olive oil to cook your the veg meat or, the or veg. something, right? So yeah. just balance it out. Because the fat will do the same solidifying, like bacon, if you don't clean that pan, you come back and you like literally wipe that white fat out. It kind of does that in your blood vessels over time. That's a good way to picture. <laughs> but, but a good example is but like I know there's a place it's the type of fat that it is it's just the type of fat it's not that you can't or shouldn't use it but Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a controversial. Save lard for those times where nothing else does it. Like if you do lard on your dry meat, just do it then kind of thing. Like when it's not well replaced by something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nutrition claims are some products will make claims about actual nutrition things about it. So like, for example, very high in fiber. So you can look for things like that. Um, they are regulated statements. So if it's on there, that means it has like more than four grams of fiber per serving. So if you're specifically looking for like more fiber things, you can look for those nutrition claims. If you're looking to decrease things like salt and sodium, um, it could say like free um, 
low in, reduced, those all mean slightly different things, but you can look for things like that, like that yogurt says reduced by 25% sugar, something like that. Um, and then if you're looking to increase, you'll see things like a good source of, or high in, very high or excellent source. So those are things you can look for. Um, and then health claims are actual claims where they connect their food product to a health benefit. So like for example, um, three grams of soluble fiber, blah, 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 blah. Um, oh, that's not right. It's a, for a heart healthy diet. So they're saying this product is beneficial for your heart. So you can look for health claims on things like reduced risk for diseases, things like that. Um, but do beware of general health claims. So like if you see this health check heart and stroke, it could still be on a product that maybe has like lots of fiber in it but it might also have like astronomical levels of like salt and sugar too. So if it's not like a regulated health claim, if it's just like a general one, it's still worth taking a peek at the actual nutrition facts. So like the example here is this PC blue menu, but this is um, like it's marketing from PC. They're, they decide what goes on their blue menu. And I think for them, it's maybe low salt, high fiber, low sugar. So it's actually okay, but you have to be careful because you could find some products with like a green check mark on it and you look at it and you're like, oh, that must be good because it has the green check mark on it. But then when you actually turn it over and look at the label, it might be really high in salt. So you, you just have to be careful because sometimes they're trying to trick you into buying their product. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the best, the best option is to read. Hmm? Yeah, it will say sodium. Yeah. Yeah. My advice would be read the label. Um, so for the sake of time, it, it is break time and she's got it out. I don't think we need to do the activity for labels or does anybody like deeply want to practice with labels? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Deeply. Yeah. Um, and then we did have a little review section. If you guys want to, if you find it useful, you can go into your manuals and reflect on the questions at the end of this section. And then maybe we can do the menu bit in yours. Um, so I took way too long. I'm blaming it entirely on you. Okay. But we did have one session at the end of the day that was canceled. And I think it's just us all day. So we can, we'll just bump, bump it. Um, does anybody have any questions before we sign off? So if we're looking to reduce sodium, salt, what percentage should we look under? What, what percentage of the label should we get? That's right. If we want to increase our fiber, what are we, what percentage are we looking for? That would be great, but for sure, 20 plus would be amazing. For sure over Get five, frustrated. right? <laughs> Anywhere between, if it's less than 5%, we should select something better. Okay, so if, it, if we want to decrease, go under 5%. If we want to increase, for sure five, more is better. That's a good good rule, mm -hmm. I would say, of thumb. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's going to be hard to find products a lot of the time with the 15% or over. Like, that would be your For dream. For the good nutrients. Yeah, that would be your yeah. dream. Like, if you could find a product 16% fiber, but I don't You'd know that your kids like are going to eat it. You'd not be able to go It'll to the bathroom. Like I don't know. That. Right? Yeah. So, I think that five is an easy thing to remember, that we want to stay below that for sugar and salt and shoot for things above that for the good stuff. I think. Yeah, in my it's opinion. a good. Yeah, I, don't know if I you agree. Share it. Totally. Yeah. yeah.